So uh, thank you all for coming out to hear about core maintenance and um, the path forward. Uh, I have uh, three lovely guests here who I'm going to ask to introduce themselves. We'll start with Gloria. Hi, I'm Gloria, or Glozao. I work on Bitcoin Core as a maintainer, mostly in mempool and P2P stuff. I also run the weekly Bitcoin Core PR Review Club, um, and I contribute to the Optech newsletter, and I'm sponsored by Brink. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Lisa. I also go by Nifty Nye. Um, I am a Core Lightning maintainer. I've been working on the project for about five years now, and recently started a Bitcoin protocol school called Base58. Hi, everyone. I'm Jess Jonas. I'm the chief legal officer of the Bitcoin Legal Defense Fund. It's a nonprofit that exists to support Bitcoin Core uh, contributors and their, with their fight against certain legal encroachments on their civil rights. Thank you. So I think we'll, we'll start with a question about core maintenance. So Gloria, if you could tell us just a little bit about you know, what is core maintenance? What does that entail? What are the challenges that people have? Sure. I mean, maybe you start with what there is to maintain. So Bitcoin Core is kind of two distinct things, I would say. One is it's the reference implementation of the protocol that we inherited from Satoshi. And the other is it's the implementation for about 98% of people to run nodes on the network. Um, so it supports anything from uh, running your Bitcoin node as a server and having lots of light clients to your Raspberry Pi node running in your living room. Um, and so it supports not just the consensus validation engine and the peer-to-peer -peer protocol, but also wallets, um, GUI, crypt a cryptography library, network management, everything. Um, so the scope is very, very large. <laughs> um, and on top of that, we have a very, very high bar for security, um, which means that things like censorship resistance or not your keys, not your coins, like these are design goals. It's not a piece of code that you can just write and you have censorship resistance or you have privacy. It's a design goal that you work towards over time uh, and the bar keeps getting higher and higher and higher. Um, so, Back to your question about what is core maintenance. Um, it's about maintaining the software that we have, which again, there's quite a large scope, and also trying to make that more robust um, and more able to support the design goals and the users of Bitcoin um, over time. So that involves protocol changes, it involves fixing security vulnerabilities, it involves addressing the many pull requests from uh, various contributors from the Bitcoin community, um, and just testing things, fixing things, cutting releases, you know, things that are common amongst a lot of software projects. But what makes Bitcoin unique is I think its scope, its security bar, um, as well as the fact that everything needs to be like backwards compatible forever. <laughs> right, right. Um, so yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> goal. And I, I assume one of the challenges, you know, in addition to the security goals is finding qualified maintainers, like people that can understand the code base and can understand the Bitcoin protocols. It's not a trivial task. And um, I wanted to bring Lisa into this conversation about like, how do we you know, how do we train? Like, how do you train somebody to work on a project like Core? Like you've had some experience in that area. Um, what would you say on that front? How, how, how does that get done? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. So when you're talking about really large code bases, right, there's kind of like two different problems that you're dealing with. I think the first one with Bitcoin is like, what is this like, what is the underlying protocol that we're operating on as a code base, right? That's typically a little bit separate than what's the actual code, like how is the code architected? What does that particular code base look like? You know, every code base, large code base, has its own quirks in terms of how it does things, where things are located, how you want, how changes are processed, like the process for making changes, et cetera. So like testing, testing, you know, the way that tests are done, that sort of thing is like kind of, so that's kind of like knowing how to contribute to a project is kind of like an entire knowledge domain. And that information typically lives with the people that work on the project, right? So for that kind of information, you'd want to talk to someone like Gloria or Merch who has been on the project for a long time and have a lot of like that domain specific knowledge about how to contribute to that specific project. What I've been working on with Base58 is more about the protocol. Mm -hmm. So the protocol is like kind of the global um, 
the global data structure that projects like Bitcoin Core operate on top of, right? It's what they change. It's like the sort of knowledge domain of like what is in a Bitcoin transaction, what kind of data goes into it, um, what are the things that blocks are composed of, like what is the like kind of underlying structure that we then write Bitcoin projects, like that then manipulate that data. Including data. lightning protocols too, I assume. Yeah, that there's need to like understand lightning, those. Yeah. Lightning as an ecosystem has this exact same separation though, right? There's the understanding of what the protocol is, which is kind of what Base58 tries to teach you. Mm -hmm. What is the actual underlying data structures? With the idea that then you can take that knowledge and go find a project like Bitcoin Core or like a core lightning project on the lightning side, or maybe it's like the Rust Bitcoin project. And then you have the understanding of what, what's going on at the base layer, like at the actual protocol layer. And then you can start learning that domain specific knowledge you need to actually maintain a project like Bitcoin core um, that's like kind of operating on top of that infrastructure. But with the idea that you have a really good understanding of some of the reasons, that, why is the protocol the way that it is? Why are we doing the things that we're doing on the protocol? And then that sort of informs what goes into the project. What are good ways to change Bitcoin Core going forward? Because if you get an understanding of like why it is the way that it is currently, and you get that through learning, like what is the protocol, why we made it that way, and then there's, again, more domain-specific quirks with actually. the protocols and everything that need to, to, to make a contribution to Core. I assume that in addition to like having that base understanding, there's probably like, it's hard for people to understand what it takes to maintain a project like Core. I think there's probably a lot of misconceptions too about, you know, what, uh, you know, what people have to do to contribute to Core besides knowing the protocol. And I think we had a discussion earlier about this, maybe some misconceptions about, you know, you know what, what's the future of Core? Like, what, what's left to be done? So I don't know if, Gloria, if you yeah. want to talk about, like, sort of what the future, you know, the future is out there that people may not realize needs to, you know, there's quite a bit of work that still needs to be done. Yeah, so the analogy I really like to use is that Satoshi found the promised land and then built this like rickety bridge to get there. And over time we found like that is the promised land that we now want to bring billions of people over to have access to decentralized money. Um, but bridges fall down if you don't maintain them. And Again, what Satoshi built, thank you Satoshi, was a little bit more of like a small rope bridge than like a big industrial, concrete, robust structure that we can funnel billions of people across. Um, and especially when we're talking about things like we want state level censorship to be resisted. Um, again, this is not just code you can write. This is something you have to maintain over time. And over the years, we've done a lot to restructure this bridge and make it more robust and um, add more lanes so that more people can go make it more scalable, essentially. Um, and so there are, like, there's kind of this continuous work of finding the holes in the bridge and patching them um, or completely restructuring something so that it, it, it holds up over time. And we have a lot of uh, protocol updates that on a surface level look like implementation details about how transaction relay works, for example, but are really about, okay, how can we, uh, so early, for example, I'm just gonna well, How, how do you make example. it resistant to these other kinds of attacks? Like exactly. Full mempools, for instance. Uh, yeah. How do we deal with that problem? <laughs> like that might be something that wasn't initially, yeah. like there weren't maybe great ways to handle that that you know that's that's a new feature but it's also just maintain maintenance in a way like yeah. the, new, the, the environment's changed that the operating the system's operating in yeah yeah exactly so there's like little things we can do like patch specific areas but then there are like bigger protocol change um, like package relay where it's like okay we're at the point where we need to be relaying packages instead of individual transactions, or we need to completely change the way that we relay transactions, for example, with Erlay, but this allows us to, again, on a surface level, reduce bandwidth, but on a more deeper level, increase the amount of connections and connectivity across the network to prevent things like eclipse attacks. Like these are like To help things like protocol. second layer protocols, like Lightning, for instance. That, yeah. You know, you, yeah, you need to understand the base layer to understand the second layer, and there's things that have to be implemented the base layer to enable features at the, the other end. Yeah. You know, the, the, the maintenance project is about supporting all of that, like supporting all those use cases on top of the core system. Yeah. Um, it takes a lot of you know, very skilled, very dedicated developers to make this happen. Um, I think I want to 
bring Jess into the conversation. So one of, there's multiple challenges besides learning the protocols and you know, doing the day-to-day -day maintenance that are, are coming across that are you know, making it difficult potentially to maintain a project like Bitcoin. And if you want to just talk about what you're, what you're working on, Jess. <laughs> yeah, sure. So at the Bitcoin Legal Defense Fund, we were established about a year ago to help Bitcoin core devs who are facing an onslaught of litigation um, for the work that they do building the Bitcoin software. And you know, when we think about the future of Bitcoin, and we think about the future of other open source projects, there really only is a future if people are going to continue building. And if the threat of litigation is so great and the likelihood of liability for doing this work is real, people will not continue to open themselves up to unknown, uncapped potential liability from a stranger somewhere in the world. And I know this is sort of like amorphous because not everybody here has the background and I'm not gonna spend a ton of time going into the work that we're doing and the cases that we're fighting. But if you wanna learn more, you can visit our website, which is bitcoindefense.org, and you can read about the cases we're fighting. But just as a quick snapshot, there are about a dozen Bitcoin developers who are being sued right now in the UK by Craig Wright for the work that they have done on the Bitcoin protocol. And the courts in the UK are taking these claims seriously, and they are evaluating the question of whether Bitcoin software developers and open source developers, so not just Bitcoin, you know, Linux, et cetera, open source developers could owe a duty to people who use their code such that they may be dragged into court in London to potentially pay damages to a stranger who is quote unquote injured by their code or potentially have to write software to save a stranger who's been quote unquote injured by their code. The potential ramifications of such a finding, which is not an entirely remote possibility, I wouldn't dismiss it just because the person who is um, bringing these claims is Craig Wright. The potential ramifications of such a finding in one of the most prominent jurisdictions in the world would undoubtedly have a chilling effect on these software developers who volunteer their time to work on open source projects. So. That's what we're here to fight. We think it's really important, and we're doing it so that there can be a future of Bitcoin and a future of open source development. Oh. <laughs> I mean, that, that works in perfectly to this idea that maintenance is about keeping this project going. It's about the, you know, this is not a project that's gonna end, right? The, the goal here is that, you know, there's a, you know, this, this legacy is gonna to have to continue and it's gonna to have to continue through the developers. So if you attack the developers, you're attacking the long-term viability of a project like this. I think it's, you know, it cannot, may, it cannot continue without a strong, well-trained, um, you know, security conscious um, set of developers that are dedicated to the project and can focus their efforts on that project. So I, I don't know if you want to talk about Gloria about the like the future. Like, what are the kinds of things that we I mean, talked about it a little bit already? But like, what are the kind of things that are still yet to be done? Like, there's still a lot to be done in the Bitcoin project. Yeah, I'm working on package relay. We'll have it soon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, um, there are. A f I think there are a few soft works that that okay. you know can. 2180, you know, let's not run out of timestamps. Um, but there are, again, like, we have these goals, like these design goals, and like, I, I just, I don't want to get too nitty gritty into the technical details. Um, but, for example, I saw this poll on Twitter, like, can the Bitcoin network withstand the US military attacking it for three months? The answer is no. Um, sorry to, to break that. Uh, illusion. Um, we're not there yet. Maybe we'll be there one day. Um, but that takes, again, being committed to this design goal that we all care about and doing 
any, anything from let's exit this loop earlier, you know, like really small little details to massive protocol changes um, that, for example, enable the network to function better. Um, the ones that I am most excited about, maybe you wanted concrete examples. Um, the ones that I'm most excited about are peer-to-peer uh, -peer encrypted transport, BIP 324, which makes the network more robust to eavesdroppers. Um, That's a good example of it's not a core protocol change, right? I mean, it's, a, it's on the core project, but I mean, it's not like a consensus change, is it? Or it is, is it not a consensus right? change. So this is, in no. the, this is in like software that just transmits the messages between the, the Bitcoin nodes mm -hmm. um, that needs to be maintained too. Oop, I lost my mic. Nope. Uh, needs to be maintained also. Like there's all the software besides just people think of, oh, you're just validating transactions. There's, you've got to pass all that data around. You've got to, you know, that, and that's networking. Like that's a different skill set potentially. Like you're not doing encryption. I mean, you're, you're using encryption libraries, but you're using them in a way to, you know, Hide people's, hide people's communication, right? Which is maybe a slightly different uh, skill set. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so that's kind of one example of a project. Um, another example, I'm just going to show package relay. I'm sorry. I try not to show <laughs> my own bags, but um, one thing that I care a lot about is like we're. We're, transi we're transitioning into this like multi-layer Bitcoin ecosystem where we have Bitcoin protocol at the base layer, and then you have Lightning, and you have other L2 applications, and you have other like not L2s but applications on top of Bitcoin, right? Um, and that makes the Bitcoin interface something that we want to um, secure. So, for example. I love talking about L2s, this idea of you enter into a contract with a counterparty that you don't trust, um, where the spending paths are all enumerated, um, such that if anybody tries to cheat, you can, always, uh, you can always settle on chain. So the security model is the same, but you get things like privacy and scalability because you don't have to broadcast everything on chain. Um, and so concretely, what that turns into usually is like you have a certain amount of time right before that spending path opens up or a spending path closes. Time to get um, a transaction committed to the blockchain. Try, yeah, time to get a transaction confirmed. And given recent events, um, sometimes it's a little bit uncertain whether you are able to get a transaction confirmed. And one way to address this is, of course, to be friends with the miner and be able to get them to prioritize it for you. Um, but what this says to me is we really need the decentralized transaction relay network to be a more efficient public auction for block space. So more predictable, I assume, is yeah, part of the more goal. More predictable. There. We need to eliminate the kind of inefficiencies where, for example, you can censor a transaction from being confirmed by playing games in Transaction Relay or in- like Going directly to miners, something. Yeah, I mean, I think Actually, being no. able to go directly to miners is, is a way to kind of- uh, Circumvent you, that yeah. public information being um, broadcast out there. Well, and Lisa, since, since you, know, you also maintain Lightning software, how do you feel like your role of maintaining Lightning with maintaining Core? Because these, like, these are two issues, like this is an exa a great example of where you know, you need to understand and, you know, be able to interact with core maintenance. Yeah, and like, so Lightning has demands on core as a project, right? It's like our roadmap, like the, the roadmap of Lightning, the features that we want to add, the ways that we want to improve the Lightning protocol to make it easier to run nodes. I think the first example that comes to mind is L2, which is a incredibly critical update to Lightning in terms of just making it so much more robust and um, almost like like your ability to run a lightning node and your risk of funds loss just kind of anyways there's like there's a really it's a really important protocol update for lightning but it requires a soft fork in Bitcoin core in order to move forward so to a large extent like Lightning is very closely tied to the work that's happening, especially in protocol upgrades. And the maintainers that are maintaining Lightning projects, and there are multiple Lightning projects, all yeah. have to be very aware of what the maintainers are doing in core. Right. And, and up to date on those protocol changes, and I assume there must be a feedback process also of yeah. you know, asking those second layer projects how they would interact with these protocol changes at core level. 
Yeah, a huge part of Package Relay has been trying to go and talk to Lightning developers to ask them, like, what essentially, like, this is an interface that we share. How do we make it mm -hmm. um, most useful and and secure? Um, yeah. Okay. So I wanted, if I, I wanted to kind of take the conversation back to like what we're talking about future or like kind of like mentioning sustainability of the ecosystem, right? If that's okay. Yeah. No. That's um, yeah. Sustainability is really what maintenance is about. Yeah. So like Joss is doing work, I think, to make it sustainable for people to stay on the project, um, even no matter what like the legal ecosystem looks like. Um, this like I work on like you know this protocol school project now. Like how does that deal with, how does that like play into the sustainability thing? One thing that I realized recently is like humans kind of like so like you know working on a school or working on longer time frames than I think the maintainers are. So even in the terms of soft forks, that's maybe like let's say a three to five year time horizon. Um, traditionally it takes about five years for a soft fork to happen in Bitcoin Core. If you go back and look at the two big ones we've had, I think they've been about five years apart in terms of whatever, so that's like the three to five year timeline of planning and working. When you start looking at schools and stuff, it's like, okay, now we're talking about like knowledge transmission across like, let's say maybe like a 20 year time frame. Humans tend to forget things around the 20 years. Like my, my kind of joke here is like, how long did it take us to get out of Iraq and Afghanistan? <laughs> um, it took about 20 years, right? We like pulled out 20 years after we went in. Why was it 20 years? Because that's about the point when you forget why you were doing it in the first place <laughs> as, a, as a generation, right? So how far away are we from the 20 year cliff point on the Bitcoin core protocol? How far are we from the 20 year point of when Greg's Maxwell and all the people that were contributing to Bitcoin talk are no longer participating in conversations? Like that sort of information and knowledge transfer, when we start talking about sustainability of maintaining Bitcoin core, for the next 20 to 40 years. I assume that also means values, like the values that originally the project is currently being built on, transmitting those over time and making sure that the, the generations of developers coming up understand why some of these, so some of these decisions are pretty esoteric in terms of security and in terms of privacy. Yeah. That, you know, you, 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 I think you're absolutely right to, to keep the project going. You don't just need technical knowledge. You also need that sort of tribal knowledge about what, what the actual foundation of this project's about. Yeah, and I kind of want to tag on to this. There's, I think, sometimes this idea of like the devs or the maintainers over there are making decisions about the protocol and making updates, or that person has a key to merge things so that they have power in Bitcoin Core to make protocol changes. Um, but I want to remind everyone that we can only merge things that the community agrees upon. Like right. this is a decentralized, um, network in a decentralized decision-making process. If I were to merge something unilaterally that nobody agreed with, the commit would be reverted, I would be removed as a maintainer, it would never make it into a release, and I'd be gone. Or, right? or, or people like, wouldn't run the software, they would run people, the fork of the software. Like, exactly. There's always the individuals decide which version of the software to run. So you're, the yeah. community is a key part of that. Yeah, we do not have any power to push code for, like we can't update your nodes for you, only the users decide what code they're going to run. We're part of this decentralized network and a part of a decentralized decision-making process. These two are very much intertwined in what we signed up for when we decided to be Bitcoiners. Um, and so, again, it's not the devs over there. We are all part of the decision-making process. And it, I hope that it is a one of technical merit of the proposals and the arguments being discussed. So I think, again, stop thinking of the, the devs over there. Like everyone in this room hopefully feels empowered to participate in this decision-making process and uphold these, these goals that we have like, we want this to be a technical-based discussion. I care about you know, whether it's censorship resistance, whether you really care about finite supply, and that's why you're in Bitcoin. Like, that translates to technical protocols and code, and like, you can contribute either by writing code or by using the code or running the code, or going to a bit devs and going, understanding going devs. the conversation of technical decisions. Like yeah. you have to write the code. Yeah. But to understand at least the motivation for the code is probably valuable for a community member potentially. Yeah, just um, engage. Like she said, uh, like Lisa said, um, like at some point we'll forget about Greg Maxwell. At some point, like we're gonna forget why we made decisions in the code. That's just gonna happen. 
Um, but what we can participate in and work towards is all trying to make sure that we understand our roles as, uh, as participants in this decision-making process and being as like knowledgeable as possible. Like you yep. said, going to Bethesda. Educate yourself also. Like yeah, individually, yeah. Individually, everybody, whether you're a developer or you're a user of the software, you, you should try to be at least at some level educated on what the, the, the issues are. Yeah. Um, and devices and we're talking about. So we're getting near the end here. I wanted to give everybody a chance to just talk about your, like your, uh, you know, what you're doing, how people can find you, and uh, yeah. So sort of I'm Gloria. I'm Glozow on Twitter. I'm Glozow on GitHub. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, if you can't write the code, uh, or you don't want to write the code, or you don't have time, you can always donate, yes. as as is on the on the screen. Um, and this. Want to mention Just a little in, bit about what this, Brink is yeah, related okay. to developers of core? <laughs> yeah. So Brink is a nonprofit that collects donations from people in the community like you. Um, and we have a grant committee composed of people with uh, technical writers, protocol engineers, protocol maintainers who understand like, okay, what, what things should we support? So we fund three Bitcoin Core maintainers. We fund the Bitcoin Core PR Review Club, which is an educational initiative. We fund the Bitcoin Optech newsletter. Um, those are all Brink, essentially, uh, initiatives funded by Brink. Um, in the next 24 hours, I believe, I think there's only 24 hours left, Marathon is tripling your donations. Um, so if you donate like 50 bucks, which, you know, it's, it's not that much, hopefully. Um, it's tax deductible, so it ends up being 30 bucks for you, and Marathon turns it into 150. So like, next 24 hours, donate to bring. So support your code. core devs, please. <laughs> <laughs> they need a lot of support. We need more core devs with funding, um, yeah. so please support them. There's At least, do you wanna, mm -hmm. thank you, Gloria. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. just super fast, um, Base58 has a pretty new website, it's base58.school. So you can check out our protocol classes. We're doing an in-person protocol class the Tuesday before Prague, all about mempools. So it's a mempool masterclass. Yeah, so please check that out. Everyone, especially anyone who wants to be a developer, Bitcoin needs more developers, so please do that. I and mean, Jess, you wanna tell us more about your? Yeah, I have a QR code, so, oh, there it is. Um, who here has a cell phone? <laughs> yeah, so pick up your cell phone, scan the QR code, and donate to defend Bitcoin developers because without your help, they cannot do the work that they do and we cannot protect them so that they are able to continue doing the work that they do. I didn't get on a plane and fly down here from New York to raise no funds. <laughs> so please help us out because this really is, a, you know, all jokes aside, the work that we're doing is really work for the community and it's not the sort of thing that one or two or three people should be funding themselves. This is the sort of thing that the community should be buying into because open source development, open source software makes up 97% of the world's software and it is under attack. Open source licenses like the MIT license are under attack and we owe it to ourselves to fight back. So use those handy cell phones, scan the QR code, please make my trip worthwhile. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Miami, for the last three years in this amazing city. The whole world shut down, but Miami welcomed us with open arms. We want to show Bitcoin to the whole world. We are taking the conference on the road to set the stage for Bitcoin in a new city. Nashville. Bitcoin 2024 is coming to Nashville in Tennessee, a city that is known as a music and freedom city. Bitcoin 2024 in Nashville from July 25th to 27th.